recording. I'm going to make sure we have the mic running. And we are set. So I have a couple of things to share with everybody in the room, as well as these gentlemen sitting here with me. We will not have class next Thursday. I told you when we first started this class that they gave me another class to teach. And it only happens four Thursdays uh, for the rest of the semester. Guess what? That's when I teach this class. So next week, you're going to get a work day. So you'll be able to complete module one um, because there's a little bit to it. And I'll give you the time to get that done. Our next uh, class that this will happen to, if you want to plan ahead, I don't know why. Let's see, February is February 21. March is March 21. How about that? We have some consistency here. And then April is, I think, the 24th? No. There it is. Yeah, April is like um, the 19th. You won't be, you'll be done by April. Trust me. You will be finished by April. So we won't be meeting in here uh, next Thursday. I'll have 32 people in this room. Can you imagine that? And they'll all be all teachers and we'll be doing something totally different. So I'll send that out on Monday so you'll, you'll know. So let's then dive into it. Here's the other thing you all need to know out there in the great beyond. What we're going to do tonight is uh, Steve and Mark and I are going to sit here and I'm not going to play the entire videos that are in this, but I do want to play enough of them to encourage you to go in and listen to them. Why? These are the people that Dr. Fullen uh, talks about in chapters two and three. Uh, these are the people that he basically bases what he talks about in these chapters on. In fact, chapters four and five as well. I told you <clears throat> last week that Dr. Fullen is an unabashed name dropper. And he sprinkles everything he writes with, you know, well, so-and-so said this, well, so-and-so said that. I wanted you to meet so-and-so. So you could actually see a face. You could actually hear their talking. Uh, and you can actually get it into your head what they're saying and how it fits into this bigger picture of technology and education. So we're going to play from these clips I have in here. Uh, and these are pulled directly from what um, Dr. Fullen talks about in the book. So we're going to hear from um, Maggie Jackson. We're going to hear from Marshall McLuhan. We're going to hear from Larry Rosen. Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, Dr. Fullen. Uh, Mark Prinsky. Mark is a Mark is an interesting name. He is the guy who basically created the term "digital native, digital immigrant." He also has a textbook out there, which I used to use, called "The Partnering Pedagogy." Um, but he's not a researcher, so um, he's kind of a He's kind of out there on the fringes, whereas everybody else I just showed you, they're all researchers. Uh, Don Tapscott. Don Tapscott is another famous name. He is the one who came up with the term net generation um, and millennial. So you can blame them for everybody looking at your cross eyed and blaming everything that's wrong with this country on millennials. And what's interesting is Don Tapscott is not from the United States. He's from Canada. Um, as is Dr. Fuller. Now, Mark here, I think Prinsky is over at Virginia Tech now. I'm not sure. Uh, Larry Rosen is in the United States. Marshall McLuhan is a Canadian. Maggie Jackson, Canadian. So you have to realize that a lot of this big thinking uh, that's going on. Now, there are plenty of big thinkers here in the United States. This guy right here. Clay Sharkey. He's the one who came up with the term, the cognitive surplus. You know, what are we going to do with all this? If, what are we doing with all this information that we can readily, you know, access? My son has his classic line. I, I, I love this line. He'll be like with his mother or somebody and they'll say, wonder how you could do that. And he'll say, geez, if only you had 
a computer in your pocket that has more power than the computers that sent us to the moon, that maybe we might be able to find the answer to that. Of course, you know what he's referring to, that phone you carry around with you. And what Shirky, what he, where he claimed the fame was, he came up with this idea about what do we do with these literally petrobytes of knowledge that we now have access to that we carry around with us. And I find it fascinating because I think that what we do is what we've always done, and that's we sort of sift through what we need to know. When I want to know how to do something in a DIY framework at home, what do I do? I go in and put it into the YouTube and find the video. The guy is going to show me how to do it, or gal. Somebody is on there that's going to show me how to do what I need to do. And if it's a sloppy video, that's okay, because there's like 20 others over there on the sidebar that I can go in and look at. But Clay was the first one who basically put that out there. This is Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly was the founding, um, I don't know if member is the right word, the founding editor of Wired Magazine. This is the guy who created Wired Magazine. And he has a really interesting take on technology. Uh, Dr. Fullen likes him a lot. So we're gonna, we're gonna listen to him a little bit. And then finally, this is Tony Wagner. Um, again, he basically is included in the book because he wants to talk about how technology is impacting us. This is what uh, chapters two and three are all about. I call it the doom and gloom. Um, but I think we need to hear the doom and gloom because if we keep going on with this sort of, oh, technology is great, everything we can do is great, we don't really have, and as you know, one of the areas of what we do here, action, inquiry, advocacy. So the action part is what I'm doing right now, is I'm throwing stuff at you. Inquiry is where you take it in and think about it and create. The advocacy is where we're giving you the ammunition so that if you want to sit down in a meeting at your school and say, look guys, this is what we need to do to think about how we're gonna use technology in this building. I cannot tell you how many schools I've sat in on, especially with this latest round of the one-to-one -one, uh, iPads that are going on out there. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue as to what does it mean? How do we use? When do we use? And what are our results gonna be? And that is, you know, that's the kind of planning that's just, is got failure written all over it. I know because I was there and we did the first one-to-one -one project where we gave out laptops to schools and that was a resounding failure. It was a great deal for Apple computer because we bought a bunch of them from them, but everything else was a failure. Again, I'll tell you the book is right here if you need it. But I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna start off tonight with giving you um, a couple of PowerPoints, and I promise you I won't do this a lot. I do not like having PowerPoints thrown at me. But I think what I need to do is to kind of give you a sense of what we're trying to get at here. And then we're going to watch these videos. Uh, not all of them. We're not going to sit through them all. Oh, I'm going to do Chapter 1. I'm going to give you Chapter 1. It's up here. But let me, I'll run through these quickly. Uh, I don't have anybody out there in the great beyond who can tell me. Let me look real fast, see if there's anybody else besides us, guys. Ah, are you in there, Mark? No, I'm not. I don't Some, think I somebody's in here then. Let Let's go see. Carrie Gupton's out there. Hi, Carrie. I'm going to show you a, I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint in just a minute here, Carrie. And will you please tell me if you can see it? I'm going to start it. No, I don't want to install the updates. Thank you, though. It's very kind of you, Microsoft. Usually what happens with these carry is I end up, I can't show them full screen. I have to just show them sort of uh, inside the window of where our class is, and it works. All right. So the question to you, Carrie, is can you see this PowerPoint? All 
All right, good deal. Pop back out, go back over here. There it is. So this is a quickie, guys. Um, this is one that, that I've made over the years. And it's just basically, so what are we trying to do here? Um, I did not come up with the term ubiquitous classroom. That's a microphone. Uh, you'll hear him talk about it. Uh, but I, what I've tried to do here is try to get it into a context that we can hang our hats on. So ubiquitous means existing or being everywhere, especially at the same time. Kids expect now technology to be ubiquitous anytime, anywhere, always on. And that is such a tremendous shift in how we have viewed technology over the years. That's why we were able to get away with uh, the way we've gotten away with all this technology was available in schools or could have been available to schools at one time, but nobody wanted to do it. I mean, it's pure and simple that. When the kids started walking in with their cell phones and their iPads and their various devices, really no. What really happened was is when kids became a part of the active directory. In other words, I walk into my building and I've got a log on name. I have a log on password. When that happened, then the floodgates open because kids could walk in with their various devices, hop up onto the Wi-Fi in the building, and off they went. Now, we're not going to go into all kinds of angst about all of that because we know the stories about all of that. This is what the classroom was, still is in a lot of places. Here's good old Bloom's digital taxonomy. This is a nice old graphic, by the way. And you know about Bloom, uh, we always want to be at the top two levels of Bloom, or actually three, um, looking at creating, evaluating, and analyzing. And these, still, these are still um, relevant. You know, they're not as uh, old as you think they are. There's stuff out there. And I think that one of the things that I want you to take away with, when we sit here and we play with all of these Web 2.0 apps that we're going to play with, yeah, I want you to understand how they work. Yeah, I want you to use them. Um, you know, in this class to demonstrate your understanding about topics. What I really want you to do is I'm giving you a pass. You may let kids log in and use these apps at your school. Okay. I'm paying for it. I've got it locked down. It's protected. As long as you don't give away the super admin username and password, which I'm going to freely give to you. I'm going to give you the super admin username and password. Just don't tell it to a kid. Most of the things that we play with, like tonight when I show you pick to chart, you can go into pick to chart and you can make your own pick to chart class in there. And then you can have kids log in and you could use something as simple as period one, password, period one, or period one, password, period one, two, one, you, you know. Um, you can have multiple kids logging in with just that one password. If you're worried about that, pull in the data from infinite campus and put the kids usernames and passwords in so they would they can't see anything except what they create when they log in they log in as that they don't see the super admin side which you and i because i give it to you to use would see so that we can go in and we can see that that jerk kid has created the, in, the infographic that has a, a giant someone giving you the finger picture in it so and nobody else would see it because you're the super admin. Well, he could then put it on his uh, Instagram or website, but that's a whole nother discussion. So that's what we are seeing is we're seeing that learners and classrooms have definitely changed. Learners are outside the classroom. You know this because you're a learner. We're always on. You know this. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm thinking about something that I want to do at home around the house and I can't go back to sleep, I'll go and sit down at the computer, pull up YouTube, pull up Google, find it, move on. Interaction is expected. We know this, kids with their Instagram accounts, they will sweat bullets checking that thing just to see who all has subscribed to it. Now, we adults can get all snooty about that and say, oh, stupid kids, but we do the same thing. We call it LinkedIn. We get all excited, I'll shut this door. We get all excited when we get that message through our LinkedIn account that says, oh, someone wants to, you know, be a part of your LinkedIn. Because especially in the business world, they've been beaten into their heads about network, network, network. So we are all expecting this now. 
Oh, by the way, under interaction, we all expect to be able to go onto Netflix now and find whatever we want anytime we want it. Social. I think what we're dealing with right now is we are dealing with the aftermath of the big social media uh, explosion that has happened. Uh, I was talking to Steve before we got started tonight about I, I got off of Facebook about two years ago. Um, I'm still on Instagram, though. How stupid is that? It's owned by the same people. Am I on other things? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Yeah. I tell you, the one that I really am on that I do enjoy is Pinterest. I still find Pinterest is probably one of the coolest social media sites that, that is out there. And it was, Pinterest was, is the latest iteration of what's called the digital magazine. And the reason why I like Pinterest is because it's clean, it's very easy to use, and man, you can crowdsource. Woo, you can crowdsource on it without it getting crazy. Do I find, I'll tell you, here's a, good, here's a good story for you about Pinterest. Do I run into things wrong with Pinterest? Sure do. Um, I was uh, looking for country decor, I think was the thing I was looking for. You know, so in other words, I was looking at how can I build a bookcase? How can I build, you know, something that had that sort of country look about it? Well, somehow Pinterest decided that what I was looking for was country girls. And so my whole Pinterest account suddenly was swamped with pictures of country girls, um, you know, primarily wearing uh, boots, jeans, you know, you get the picture, standing by a horse. Um, and I'm like, what the hell? Where did this come from? Well, you know, if you think about metadata, the first line you put in is country. Well, there's a whole other lines underneath it after that. If I'd cut it, gone in there instead of just putting country in, if I'd put in country styled furniture, I'd been okay. So I took the blame for it. My wife found it hilarious. She's like, <laughs> really? Are you serious? <laughs> Highly customized experiences. Do I need to say any more? You know, we expect to be able to go in now to our social, our media, and we expect to be able to, on our end, decide what we want to see, when we want to see it. This is the one, this is that classic picture. And this is a really interesting, I think this is the one thing that has hurt us as educators more than anything else. Well, as adults, really. You know, it's the old classic line about how do you program your DVR, go get a 12-year-old. We all have seen this kind of picture where the kid is sitting there. I have a little uh, one-year-old great nephew that uh, my wife takes care of. He's a doll. I love Chance to death. And Chance has done exactly that, right? Before he could even walk, he grabbed my wife's eye iPhone was, you know, fiddling with it. And she's like, oh, look, he's going to use the iPhone. No, he can't. All he's doing is he's swiping and tapping. He has no direction. He has no real focus on that. And I read an article by one of our profs here. He's talking about that the great myth about digital natives is we think they are born with this knowledge in their head. They are not that what we should be doing at a very early age is getting kids to understand the affordances that are out there for technology. If we did that at an early age, because you and I both know, you all have walked into your classes at school and you sit there with kids who can't log in. You just want to go, wait a minute. <laughs> You're the digital native. You should know how to log in. Well, I'm trying. So I think this is one of those misconceptions that we've allowed to just sort of linger around that has hurt us in education. Um, you know, we, we very early on had long discussions about bringing tech into preschool classes, but then it got bogged down with, there were certain things that we felt were necessary so kids could learn. I used to be in charge of the computer test in Jefferson County Public Schools. And I always made the fifth grade keyboard test that you had to be able to type at 30 words of, uh, 30 words a minute why that was the standard for getting a job for getting a temp job or a secretary job or administrative assistant job and i think it's actually gone up now but people would would send me the nastiest emails why are you testing this these kids fingers can't handle this i would say so you're telling me they can sit and swipe and do all the things on their various devices, but they can't learn to type. 
Now, I can't type, gentlemen. I mean, I can type. I'm not a touch typist. You know, I can I can crank out about eh, 40 words. You know, my son, who did take typing, you know, he sits there with the damn keyboard in his lap and types. In other words, he's sitting there like this. Tip, 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 tap, tap, tap. And he's 80 words a minute. Now, if he puts it in the right place, it sits the right way. He's up to 120. So when I was putting all this together, I said, we we have to turn out people who not only can write legibly, <laughs> which is another skill we've let get away, but we have to be able to turn out people who can keyboard in a way that is um, they can get something done. We're always connected. We always have instant access. This is the normal experience that kids had. What do kids now have in yours? Now, I could go through this, and I'm going to go through it very quickly because we're going to come back to this. When we come back to TPAC, which will be the next thing we do after we get the stratosphere out of the way, this is the key takeaway, one of the key takeaways from TPAC. Excuse me. There are like four or five. But this is one of the key takeaways from TPAC, and that is if we allow teachers the time and the focus, they can understand how affordances, again, going back to that, so I've got these iPads in my classroom. I've got this web app that this idiot in this class I took at UofL showed me. These affordances that teachers create through playful interaction with their curriculum. That is how, as you'll see when we get to Punya and Kohler, how they look at technology authentically integrated into a classroom. I'm not going to go through these because we'll be looking at different stuff. No, we will be looking at this tonight. This is infographics visually explained. And you know, you can, you can ask me, why do we, why do you focus on this infographic thing, Steve? I think it's really important that we give people a chance, especially these, the, the kids that are in classrooms, you, although you guys are a little older, but you'd be surprised how many of these classes I teach here are full of undergraduates, you know, people who are 18, 19, 20 years old. When we sit down and start talking about a literate form of evaluation, you're going to need to write a term paper four to five pages long. They don't know what that means. They do not know what that means. And then as an old, old school guy, and I get up and I talk about APA style, don't even go to, you know, don't even go to the other styles, uh, APA style, because that's what you use in, in social sciences anyway. Their eyes just cross. I mean, they literally cross. I never learned any of this. This is not fair. How can I do this? This is not fair. And actually, APA is the e easy one to do, in my humble opinion. Well, anyway, when I change that evaluation to something where I can bring in a visual component to it, no complaints, everybody lights up. But here's the thing. What they don't realize is the same rubric, the same way that I'm holding them responsible for that research paper, I'm holding them responsible for that graphical <coughs> image laden creation that they have. We live at a time of producers and consumers. We call it prosumers. You know this as well as I do. Go on to YouTube. And how many people on YouTube have channels that start with, Hi, YouTubers. Welcome to my channel. This week, we're going to take a look at why my toilet won't flush and how you can fix that. There are literally people out there. My son's a perfect example. <clears throat> my son is a licensed um, therapist. And he works with, he works with uh, troubled families. He likes working with troubled kids. That's his, that's his, as he calls it, that's my real job. His job that he loves is he is a podcaster and a, and this is where people get into arguments. It's, you know, some people call it vidcasters, vlogcasters, you know, I just call them YouTubers. So he and a group of about five other people have a podcast out there. It's all about table games, Dungeons and Dragons, that kind of thing. It is the number one podcast in that particular niche inside of iTunes. Now, Five other people. One guy is in London, England. Two guys and a gal are up at Minneapolis. And the fourth one, I forget where the fourth one is. They once in a while, they'll, they'll talk about, let's get together and, you know, come have a party at somebody's house. 
and they can't ever figure they can't ever get it together but they certainly can get it together when they have to meet before they record and they sit and they talk etc cetera, etc cetera. using all the stuff that you know they use streaming uh video stuff they use all that stuff that gamers use and when i say gamers i mean video gamers the kids who go in and literally record playing games and then they share it out but one side of the house they do is a podcast it's just all audio and then they'll basically play the game and then they'll step back and they'll talk about the various aspects of the game the other side of the house that youtubing side they basically then go in and show you the game etc 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 now he hates me saying this <laughs> but i'm going to say it that guy is pulling down eighteen hundred dollars a month running those two little things so this has totally changed how we think about prosumers anybody anybody can have a video channel on youtube you have to show that you have a certain amount of subscribers to your channel but then you can monetize the channel you can you can you can start monetizing your channel whenever you want but the only time the only way you're going to get paid is google who owns youtube basically has to see that people coming to your channel then are receiving the advertisements that the Google then hooks up to your channel. I don't do any of that. I have YouTube channels, but mine are, well, the YouTube channel that I own is the way that I create the stuff that you people see when you get it from me. Why do I use it? Because the YouTube, what the YouTube does better than anything else is to take cruddy video <laughs> and clean it up. Um, so when I create the video of this, ultra that we're running right now it cleans it up so it doesn't see that's you know that's the real world right now we are all networked we are all connected we all have expectations of customizable all right so that's just sort of a way of introducing you then to here comes the interesting news so we now know that we're all connected we now know that more and more kids are getting in on this. Uh, have you all seen the app out there called Like? So at one time there was an app out there called Vine, which was like a five second little video app that you could go on and you could sit there and you could say, I like cheese. And you could post it so everybody could see it. The Like one, what it's different, what's different about it is, is it has all of the filters built into it and special effects built into it. So you can stand there and you can do something and then have a little magic wand appear or have a sparkles appear around you or you can disappear and come back. Like has exploded all over the web. Um, actually, I should, we should quit calling it the web. We should start calling it what it is, the Internet, because more and more uh, people aren't doing things on the web. People are doing things through these secure networks of these various apps that are out there we realize very quickly that kids are totally tuned into all of this. What kids don't realize is what they don't know. Now I'm going to do one more PowerPoint. This is the chapter one. Um, this one is uh, by, uh, who is her name? I forget where she's from, but let's go ahead and go. When we look at technology in schools, we can easily see that it hasn't played much of a role up to this point. By the way, this uh, PowerPoint is five years old, just to give you a background. You and I both know from an administrative side of education, I'm sorry, technology is there. It's all the way there. What we're talking about here and what Fullen wants to talk about is where it is in classroom. Now here's where he comes in with his points. These are his criteria to integrate technology and pedagogy. It must be irresistibly engaging. What does he mean by that? It is so interesting to kids that they will spend the quality time, their time to understand and how to use it. My corollary to this particular criteria is this. If it takes you more than 15 minutes to show a kid how to use a piece of technology, it ain't worth the time. And you'll see that corollary when we 
watch Larry, when we watched uh, Dr. Rosen. So this is first one, elegantly efficient and easy to use. Again, that 15 minute timeline. If I can't get in, use it, get out in an efficient manner, I'm not gonna wanna use it. I'm just not gonna wanna use it. Now there's some things that we'll play with here. Beyond is one of them, which is a cartoon creative app that allows you to go in and make your own movies with your own characters. You can make your own avatar, put yourself into it. That's complete with props, everything, sound effects, music, everything. Um, and it is very much a immersive tool. You can't go in and do it in 15 minutes. I mean, I can show you how to use it in 15 minutes, but then when I turn it over to you, you'll get, you'll just get sucked in and you'll want to keep using it. So it still kind of fits into the, the thing about being elegantly efficient. In other words, it's easy to use, but then the creation piece on the outside is, can be very time consuming. Uh, the infographic that we're going to see tonight from picture charts, very easy to create, very easy, very easy. The technologically ubiquitous, the 24 seven, is this stuff available to me when I go home from school? And the answer is yes, it better be. Is it steeped in real life problem solving? Now this is where we kind of bump up against what does real life problem solving mean? When you, when you have had any training or any uh, teaching along the lines of understanding by design, the Wiggins and McTeague curriculum guys, um, understanding by design was built in, baked into the Danielson framework, which we all have bid a fond farewell to, um, which was a joke. But the understanding by design side of, the, of that was really solid stuff. And what these guys are talking about when they talk about it is that all of education is about understanding that is applied. There you go. We're done. We're out. And then what Fulwin comes along and says is, yeah, but that application needs to be something that is real world. We get really tired of hearing that, don't we? We get so tired of hearing that. I think that one of the things that we have to realize is your real world is not my real world. Your problem solving is not my problem solving. So we have to think in terms of a much bigger basket of a prompt that we give the kids that we then give them the time and the space and the room then to create what they want to create out of it. In other words, make it applicable to me. I'm going to go through this very quickly. We're going to look at chapter two in just a second here. So the doom and gloom. It's all about narcissism, addiction, ADHD, low empathy, voyeurism, obsession, bipolarities, poor sleep, hydrochondria. Yeah, yeah, it's all that. Technology is dangerous. Don't let kids near it. And so what Mike is trying to get to in all of this is how do we, how do we, and there's good old Don, how do we walk that very fine line between kids engaged and creating as opposed to kids just numbed down and dumbed down. And my answer to that and his answer to that <laughs> is that we have to realize that we have to put it into that whole formula that we were taught very early on that very early on uh, mantra that we were given as teachers. You must teach to the challenge level. If you teach to the frustration level, ain't nothing going to happen. And if you dumb it down, then what happens is people just are bored with it. They, they don't have any interest in it. Um, mathematics. Mathematics is a great, great uh, regimen of teaching. The problem with mathematics is there's so much of it that can be very uh, fundamental and, and very sort of foundational. Look, you need to know this to do that. And so people who have, uh, who are sort of tuned into that way of thinking, they love mathematics. The kid though, that needs the challenge of mathematics, who isn't tuned into that, I got to know the fundamentals. They just shut down right away. It is such a hard, hard thing to teach in this day and age. Believe me, I've sat through many, many K-TIP classes, watching people teach math. And I've seen some extraordinary people who teach math. And the thing I keep coming back to over and over again is somehow they manage 
to take that that fundamental you got to know this guys and then put it into the knowledge challenge part of it that kids then oh okay so you want me to do this this and this oh now i see how it fits into that challenge piece how much has really changed i think we're starting to see those changes um more and more what we're seeing is more and more the technology is literally just shoving its way into the front door and that that is dictated by uh, economics more than anything else economics and the fact that something that michael dr fullen talks about the skinny is already occurred the skinny in terms of technology in schools technology at this university goes by a very simple four-letter acronym it's called wi-fi once Wi-Fi became as ubiquitous as it is now, and once Wi-Fi became as stable as it is now in schools, universities, hell, you, you realize when it starts showing up there, then we really are ubiquitous. Um, you know, we used to go into hotels and the big argument you had before you, you know, you and your wife went to the hotel room was, are we going to buy the Wi-Fi, honey, or not? We don't need the Wi-Fi. Well, we could probably might want to check up on stuff. Now you go in the hotel, it's just part of what you are. You know, that's how ubiquitous it's become. So it's pushing it, it has pushed its way into the, the school. Now it's standing out in the, on the curb waiting to be hauled in or all the Chromebooks that are going to be brought into school or all the iPads or some device. This is not a class about devices, okay? But some device will become part and parcel. I went to a school, uh, TT Knight Middle School, not too long ago uh, to work with a Project Lead the Way class out there who wanted to start a podcast. And that's what I do for the state of Kentucky is I help schools understand how to create podcasts. And one of the things that uh, I noticed when I was there was, well, three things I noticed when I was there. Number one, every kid had a device. These were not iPads. These were some Android device. Every kid treasured that device. When I asked a kid to let me look at it, he wouldn't let me take it. He would show me, but he wouldn't let me touch it. They also were um, encased in a, in a case that could take a beating. And I saw that actually happen. Uh, two boys were out in the hall waiting for class to start. And they were standing there and they had their binder, their uh, tablet, and their books. And the one kid said, all right, it's on slammed everything down the other kids slammed everything down and they started to fight and of course being an old educator i just immediately stepped in between the two of them and they're looking at me like who the hell are you <laughs> get out of the way i gotta beat that guy up and that time though another teacher because they always are standing in hallways now she starts yelling administrator administrator security you know i'm just standing there talking to these two kids hey did you think you broke that tablet and you threw it down <laughs> they're just looking at me like what are you so here come the administrators and they start packing everything up, taking the kids away. And I said to the, um, this vice principal, I said, hey, can I see one of those tablets when you get them down to the office? I just want to see if they actually broke it. He said, no, I didn't break it. You can't break them. Then I went into the Project Lead the Way class. The kids walked in. They put their tablets underneath. Um, and then when we start talking about the things we're going to use, I use an online tool called Soundation. She'll actually do the recording and, and the post-production of podcast. I don't use um, Audacity anymore, mainly because the foundation does it all and it's, it's even easier to use. And what I noticed was when I started talking, they were reaching down underneath the desk and taking out the devices. What had happened? In that building, the use of the device had become part and parcel of school. And so kids knew that when we're going to start talking about something that's related to either a web application or something that has to do with technology or to their Google Classroom. It just comes out and is a part of what they do. You and I would walk into our classes when we were kids and we would take out the notebook that was for that particular class uh, and the pen or the pencil. And if it was math class, um, you know, you took out your uh, handy dandy TI calculator. Um, in my day, when I took classes, uh, I also had slide rules, but we won't go there. The point is, in that school, it had become part and parcel. Now, here's the, here's the last thought. Do they take these devices home? No, they do not. They do not take them home. The last class of the day, they turn their devices in. 
they are then sent back to the library where the library literally catalogs them just like you do books. And then when they come to school, first period then, the tablets are delivered to the class on that book cart, just like you think about a book cart being. And they get their tablets to pick them up for the rest of the day. What has happened in that building is, and I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of imagination. Tablets are being broken. I mean, kids work really hard to break tablets, you know, who go into fits of anger. That happens. But what I'm trying to say is they have a plan in place to minimize where the breakage was occurring, going home, where the theft was going, going on when it went home. And they have a plan where it's part and parcel. It is a part of what we normally would do in schools. We need to go to the library, check out a book on the thing you're going to research. Sure. We're going to go to the library. We're going to get a um, book for you to read for your English class. Sure. We're going to go to the library and get the, the books that we're going to using for this class. The library sent the carts to them. And when I talked to the librarian, she was like, yeah, she said at first it was a bit of a pain. But then what I realized was I'll just use the kids that are, you know, sent to me to work in the library. You know, as an old audio visual guy from my high school days that wheeled in the 16 millimeter projectors and set it all up and then turned and said, Mr. Sh Mr. Smith, your, your movie's ready to show. And I turned it on and I would go and, and leave. And then when it didn't work, Mr. Smith would look at it and go, what the heck? And then, you know, I had to come back. There's nothing new here, people. It's just understanding how it changes things. So what Mike is saying, what it really needs to change is how we interact with kids. And it's already changing, ladies and gentlemen. It's called the Google Classroom. It's already changing. So pedagogy and change. I'm not going to linger here very long because we're going to talk about pedagogy when we talk about TPAC. This is uh, Mark Prinsky. This is right out of his partnering pedagogy. Weren't you the one, Carrie, who told me you had used uh, Prinsky's book? Let's see if she answers me. Yeah, I got to go look. Yes. So was it the partnering pedagogy book? Partnering pedagogy book that you used? Or was it some other book you had written? He's a very prol prolific writer. Oh, he wrote it back. It was another one. Okay. He's a very prolific writer. Um, and you look here and he's talking about doing less telling, connecting. We've been talking about doing less telling folks for the last 20 years. Connecting what is taught with real world outcomes. We've been talking about that for a long time. Between ding, Distinguish between skills and tools. This is the one I think where we're, we're screwing up. We're not helping kids understand how to use that tool to then do those skills that we're asking. When you look at something um, where we look at inter technology integration and we look at the different levels of the technology integration, one of the things that we hit on real fast is this idea about, are we just substituting paper and pencil? Are we now actually using it to do research? Are we now actually using it to create new? Are we now actually using it that we're creating something new and we're sharing it with the world in some way? You know, this, this is the kind of rethinking we need to be doing. Uh, number eight is a biggie. Um, I can't tell you, I remember I went to this, I was the guy, you all can hate me in Jefferson County. You can hate me. I was a guy that brought smart boards into Jefferson County Public Schools. Hate me, hate me. Uh, oh, man, hold on, Carrie. We're going to see what you said. Okay. Yeah, I know that book. Here's what I would see with smart boards. We went in and we did. We did good smart board training. But every time I go back into a classroom, because I always had to go back and collect the data and see what was happening, what I saw was teacher-centric, walking up to the board and tapping and saying, look, we can do this, or look, we can do this. And the kids were just passively watching out there. Now, it was a rare teacher, but you did find teachers who would say, Johnny, come up here and show us how many bubble gums you'd have to put in to equal, you know. 
and he would come up and he would mess with. When we first put uh, smart boards in schools, we didn't mount projectors. They were just on little tables. And especially like in fifth grade, middle school, middle school, my God. In middle school, the kid would walk up and he would just barely tap the cart. And then we throw off the smart board. Then he'd walk up to it and he would, you know, touch the smart board and the cursor wouldn't jump to where his finger was. It'd be over here somewhere. And then all, you know, hilarity would, would ensue. Because nobody knew how to make it all reset and all that. When we got the projectors in, I went into a classroom and this teacher was doing a bang up job. She was doing an amazing job of teaching weather. And so she came to me and she said, now here's what I'm going to have them do. And I sat there and I went, why are you going to do all that work? Why are you doing all that work? Make them do it. So here was their, here was their task they had to do. They had to look up a city anywhere in the world. And then they had to create the forecast for the coming two weeks for that city, create a presentation that they would show through the smart board, the various tools that smart board could do about what the weather was going to be in that city. Um, and then make the conclusions about, well, it's not a good week to go visit Moscow. And when we got, we started with it, she had four computers in her classroom. And so we basically said, okay, so we need to have four groups. Uh, and we're going to make sure the people in the group all understand what their job was. She knew all that cold. She could do that cold. When the kids got done, they had it on their flash drive. They came up, plugged it into the teacher's computer. And they were up there doing that classic, as one kid said, this is so cool. I feel like I'm a meteorologist on TV. So he would be up here and he would be below and he would drag it down over the board to show you how where it was going to come from how it was going to impact whatever city they were talking about then they would have pictures of the city and they were talking about the implications for the weather for that city folks that's how you get kids to be the primary users of classroom technology we spent um, looking at number 10 there we spent literally $100,000 a school, and we only did in certain schools, to put a school of classrooms that had video conference rooms in. You all had one, Mail had one, Southern had one, Atherton had one, Ballard had one. Middle schools, it was Mazik, No, and Conway. And these were, you know, you walked in and these were very high tech for the time, connected to satellites, um, had a great big box. Nobody was allowed to touch except me. And that box then was connected to a satellite dish up on the built top of the school. We had state of the art televisions. We had 27 inch CRT televisions. Now, my friend sitting here who works in a planetarium is chuckling to himself because he has seen this kind of thing in, in anywhere. You know, we don't today. Could you imagine if we tried to say to people at any level at this university, oh, we're going to put a 27 inch TV in there for you to watch. They would go nuts. You know, if it's not 45 inches and it's not panel, we're not interested in, you know, the the uh, the rigor, the standard now is 70 inch LCDs, but we can't afford those. So that's why Gary goes out and buys what he buys. But my point is we did this with just very small groups of kids in schools, but very few schools at a horrendous cost. How much does it cost to connect to Skype? Zero. And I remember I went to Atherton one time and the guy, he was an ESL teacher there. He's a good teacher. And he was trying to set up the classroom to talk to this gal who had written a book called Bombs Over Baghdad, which was her firsthand account of being in Baghdad when we bombed the hell out of it in Gulf War I. Um, and it was, it's, a, it's a great read. In fact, it went on to become, it's a graphic novel. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to literally have his kids be able to sit down and talk to this lady. We could not get the video conference room to work. That's why he drugged me over there. 
you know, you're the guy who knows how to do this. I said, we're not going to do this. We're just going to use Skype. We're just going to run Skype into your classroom and use it. Skype was not all that new, but it was new enough. So we came in, I brought my laptop in, I had all the connections on it. Um, one email to her, so what's your Skype name? You know, boom, we were connected. And what happened then was because we had a very large projection that we could do, he literally had the kids sitting around, you know, in a semicircle in front of this uh, with a camera so she could see them. They were all ESL kids and they all had their own stories to tell about what it was like to have come to this country. He was a, and there were district people there, there were news people there. It was really kind of interesting. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go out now and we're gonna take a look at the stars of the show tonight. So let's go and let's carry. We're gonna expect you to give us um, a thumbs up or a thumbs down because I cannot play these videos through my computer. Uh, it's not set up, you know, to do that. I've tried, believe me, I've tried. So if you'll just let us know that you can hear it, uh, I'll appreciate it. If you can't hear it, uh, if you just, or if you feel like, you know, I get, well, again, I'll apologize. I have worked hard at trying to get this to work. But let's go and take a look at some of these people. I'm going to start with the guy in 1967, people, 1967, 50, 52 some odd years ago. Listen to what he was saying. The electronic environment makes an information level outside the schoolroom that is far higher than the information level inside the schoolroom. In the 19th century, the knowledge inside the schoolroom was higher than the knowledge outside. Today it is reversed. The child knows that in going to school, he is, in a sense, interrupting his education. Education must shift from stenciled instruction. I'm going to stop right there, and here's your formative assessment for the evening, everybody. When was this said? When did he say this? What was it? Come on. 1967. 1967. Oh, Carrie, how about it? Could you hear it? He's over here going, what? Okay, good. 1967, this guy's already talking about this. Marshall McLuhan was an English professor at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario. Um, his classroom, after he passed, he passed in the mid-80s. His classroom was locked up, uh, and you can still go see it. You're not allowed in it. You just kind of look through the windows at it. It's kind of like Hemingway's farm down in uh, Cuba. You're not allowed to go into the buildings on Hemingway's farm. You just look in the windows. But McLuhan was a enormous, enormous figure in the late 60s and 70s. Um, he didn't like the fact that he was considered a part of the counterculture. Uh, and where the University of Toronto is, in um, Toronto, it's a huge, huge campus. But where his classroom was in the College of Education is in a part of the area that's off of Bloor. And Bloor Street in Toronto was sort of the hate Ashbury of its time. Uh, it was where all the hippies went, where all the dope went. And that's, you know, uh, there's a building there that's uh, now a sort of a hotel apartment building that was known as the free university. It was the first free university that was ever created where people basically went in and taught whatever they wanted to teach. And you went in, you didn't pay for it. Um, it got into trouble because people were experimenting with LSD in there and they're jumping off the roof to see if they could fly. But Marshall McLuhan was talking about this kind of idea about that electronic means of education was affecting kids more than what the classroom was. Now here's how education responded to that, because I was there. So the idea that education adopted was, well, we have so many kids that we need to teach, and we have these, wait for it, standards that we all should know to be a functioning part of Western civilization. So we're going to put televisions in classrooms. 
so we can teach 300 people at one shot. Now they took the idea from universities, and you all ever had taken a general course at a university where you sit in that stadium with all the people? They took that idea from them. And so 300 people would be crammed into about three rooms and there would be these giant 27 inch televisions. She's coming me with stuff. I need to. Not you. <laughs> okay. But he was right there at the beginning of all of this. Now, I'm going to come back to Larry. But let me just give you a little bit of Maggie. Well, as you know, distracted is in the headlines. We can barely pick up a newspaper without an article about state legislatures trying to ban texting in the cars. Um, I just heard that Hugh Jackman was in a in the yeah, Australian actor. Uh, stopped the play he's currently in on Broadway recently and berated someone in the... Excuse me, I think it's Hugh Jackman. Is that okay, gentlemen, if we correct her? Mm -hmm. I think it was Hugh Jackman you're referring to, Maggie? Audience for keeping their cell phone ringing and ringing and ringing. Um, and uh, I actually Googled distracted and found 11 million hits. So, I mean, that in itself is distracting. 11 million mm -hmm. pieces of information. Um, so... How do we get to the place where the norm for both our children and adults is noisy, cluttered, fragmented, overloaded, speed driven? I mean, how do we get to the place where we keep one eye on our Blackberry and one eye on our spouse? Well, you can tell that's long. No. Let me stop there with her and take you then to Clay. This is the man who basically said cognitive surplus. We'll, step, we'll sit on clay for a little while. I hope you can hear it. Oh, there it goes. The story starts in Kenya uh, in December of 2007 when there was a disputed presidential election. And in the immediate aftermath of that election, and there was an outbreak of ethnic violence. And there was a lawyer in Nairobi, Oria Kola, who some of you may know from her TED talk, who began blogging about it on her site, Kenyan Pundit. And shortly after the election and the outbreak of violence, the government suddenly imposed a significant media blackout. And so weblogs went from being commentary as part of the media landscape to being a critical part of the media landscape in trying to understand where the violence was. And Akola solicited from her commenters more information about what was going on and the comments began pouring in and Akola would collate them, she would post them and she quickly said, it's too much. I, can, I could do this all day, every day and I can't keep up. There is more information about what's going on in Kenya right now than any one person can manage. If only there was a way to automate this. And two programmers who read her blog held their hands up and said, we could do that. And in 72 hours, they launched You Shahidi. Yushahidi, the name means witness or testimony in Swahili, is a very simple way of taking reports from the field, whether it's from the web or, or critically via mobile phones and SMS, aggregating it and putting it on a map. That's all it is, but that's all that's needed because what it does is it takes the tacit information available to the whole population. Everybody knows where the violence is, but no one person knows what everyone knows. And it takes that tacit information and it aggregates it, and it maps it, and it makes it public. And that, that maneuver called crisis mapping was kicked off uh, in Kenya in January of 2008. And enough people looked at it and found it valuable enough that the programmers who created Yushahidi decided they were going to make it open source and turn it into a platform. It's since been deployed in Mexico to track electoral fraud. It's been deployed in Washington, D.C. to track snow cleanup and has been used most famously in Haiti in the aftermath of the earthquake. And when you look at the map, now posted on the Ushahidi front page, you can see that the number of deployments in Ushahidi has gone worldwide. This went from an, a single idea and a single implementation in East Africa in the beginning of 2008 to a global deployment in less than three years. 
what's the point here? So the point here is, is yes, if we let it distract us, if we let it in, inundate us, it will. Two quick stories. My daughter was uh, in Egypt, part of her honors program that she was in up at Northern Kentucky University. And as a part of that, she was given the opportunity to go to Egypt. Her daddy, of course, was scared to death of her going to Egypt. This was back when the whole uh, Arab Spring was just starting. And I was terrified letting my little blonde haired, blue eyed princess go do something like that. She told me she would be fine, that she was made of sterner stuff than that. I should have realized when the girl went out for the rugby team there at uh, Northern that she was going to be okay. She told us she would Facebook us. She got over there and all of a sudden she found herself in the middle of the enormous uh, protests that were going on there in uh, the square in Cairo. And what she did is she went back to her hotel room and they hadn't turned off the internet by then. And she started Facebooking it, and then she started blogging it. And all of a sudden her viewpoint, this Western viewpoint about what was going on got out there. Now, I don't know how it got out there in terms of the people that she was interacting with that were Egyptians, but they came up to her and they were thanking her immensely to the point that they invited her to a mosque. Now, of course, she wore the headscarf and all that as a you know, sign of respect. But this one little kid from Louisville, Kentucky, got to have a little tiny piece of that whole Arab Spring. Second story. Good friend of mine, his name is David Wicks. David used to be the environmental specialist for Jefferson County Public Schools. David used to be the guy that would come to meetings and say, do you realize that we're filling up a 53 foot long tractor trailer truck of paper every week in Jefferson County Public Schools? You know, the waste that we create. Uh, he was the force behind something called wisdom. We won't talk about that, but just to let you know. He retired out of JCPS and he came here to work at UofL at the same time I did. And he came over one night and was talking to me about how he wanted to have his GIS class understand how to create a way of looking at watersheds. That's kind of his thing. Um, you may know David from the fact that he is the voyageur or canoe guy. He has these giant wooden canoes that he takes people out in on the Ohio River with, and then they paddle up the various tributaries in the Ohio River, you know, uh, Beargrass Creek, Heritage Creek, et cetera, um, and he shows people, well, here's where your pollution's coming from. Here's the sources. Here's the outfall from MSD. Oh, yeah, it does stink, doesn't it? You know, he, he that's, that's David. What he wanted to do was to start mapping and telling the story of another very large tributary in Jefferson County called Floyd's Fork. And at the time that we were sitting down and talking about it, I knew about Floyd's Fork because I had done a lot of work at the uh, Y and we had a camp that was literally located on the banks of Floyd's Fork, uh, which is now the uh, golf club out there, Valhalla. But when I was out there with kids, we had horses, we were teaching them how to ride, and we were, we were teaching them how to canoe. So I had canoed up and down Floyd's Fork a great many times. Love it. It's a beautiful waterway. David wanted to help kids in his GIS class understand how do you go about understanding the riparium, the topography, and all that stuff that has to do with mapping a waterway. I had heard about the Kenya experiment, and we brought that to something called Frapple Maps. In other words, using Google Earth and basically going in and putting in pins, and then kids would research various parts of Floyd's Fork and come back, and then they would do the reporting. Basically, the reporting consisted of the following things. Where is this located? And by located, that didn't mean drive up the road and, you know, when you cross the bridge. No, they had to actually put in the map coordinates, et cetera, et cetera. Elevation, 
uh, setting. In other words, was it rural? Was it urban? You know, um, and then some part of would make that an interesting. So why would I want to go to this place you have on the map? There's a pretty waterfall there. And then also they were expected to have pictures. And we were using, you know, the very first, you know, cameras, uh, electronic cameras. We weren't using film. Put it all together, the kids did a beautiful job. So we came up with this presentation of this lovely Frapple map of all these different pins on it that then we basically had the kids then would go back and then report back. One of the things they had to report on was water quality. We weren't too sophisticated with water quality. We weren't taking samples and doing all that, but we were basically taking the samples of did it smell? If you did a beaker into the water and held it up, could you see through it? You know, was it murky? Was it whatever? Cloudy, murky. Uh, if you flipped over a rock in the water, did something come out? Were there crayfish? Were there fish? You know, were there frogs? Were there evidence of beavers? Were there evidence of muskrats? You know, we put all that into these. He gets a phone call from some people, uh, the mayor for life, Jerry Abramson, and they basically ask him to come in and do a presentation of this thing. He takes the kids in, we go in, we sit in the back of the room, and we let the kids run the show. From that sprang the idea of the Parklands. Because what the kids were showing them was, look, when we went out to these sites and we reported this is what it looked like then, then we went back and reported again what it looked like the water quality had degraded because people had come in and built houses or the farmers had come in and, and put down the fertilizer and the pesticides. What I'm trying to say is, yes, we can get distracted. Or as Clay is saying here, we can create something that gives people a chance to understand. Now let's go to the boogeyman. So this is Larry Rosen. I am probably going to let this run the entire thing. Gentlemen, what time is it? Are you doing okay? All right, we're good. So I'm going to let Larry have his day in court. talk about today is a couple things. First, I'm going to talk to you about why we are all being inundated with issues because technology is changing so rapidly that we can barely keep up. I'm going to talk to you about focus and attention. I'm going to talk to you about our brains from a structural level and from a biochemical level. And then I'm going to talk about how what neuroscientists know about how technology does affect our brains. And then I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of advice on how to keep your brain healthy and not support your software, not support your hardware, but support your humanware. So let's take a look at technology. Consumer scientists look at a metric called penetration rate. When a technology reaches or any product reaches 50 million users, it's considered to penetrate society. So those of us who are old enough to remember, radio took 38 years to penetrate society. The telephone took 20, television took 13, cell phones took 12, and then the World Wide Web came in and everything spiraled out of control. Four years to go from nothing to 50 million people. iPods took three years, blogs took three years, MySpace, remember that? MySpace took two and a half years, Facebook took two years, YouTube took only one year, and Angry Birds took 35 days. And in fact, what's happening now is all the new technologies that are coming in are coming in so rapidly that literally we are part of a human experiment. We are being inundated all the time. And I could have just as easily ended that with Instagram or Snapchat or Reddit or any of the technologies that within a very short period of time inundate our society. Part of what I do as a research scientist is I look at a variety of topics. And one thing I'm very interested in is how our students study. So we went into homes and 
sent in 279 observers to observe middle school, high school, and college students studying. We told the students, we'd like you to study something truly important, really important, like studying for a test, studying for some sort of project, something that's very, very important. We wanted them to focus. And what we said is, we're going to just observe you. And we sat in the background and we observed them. We looked to see, first of all, every minute for 15 minutes, were they on task or off task? Were they studying what they said or were they off task? What was on their computer screen at any given time? How much technology they use on a daily basis? We asked them questions about whether they had strategies for studying. We also asked them some questions about whether they preferred to work on something until it was done and then switch to a second task. Work a little on this, switch back, forth, back, forth. Not surprisingly, they all do that. And then we also measure, ask them just what's their grade point average. So this graph shows on the bottom side, you see the 15 minutes of observations. On the left-hand side, what you see is the percentage of time on task. First thing I want you to notice is that 70% was the average they were able to do. Even though they were supposed to be studying something truly important, 70%. So for the first couple of minutes, they were focused. And then they got distracted. And then they focus again. And then they get really distracted about the eight to 10 minute mark. And then they start to focus again, but we think that's an aberration because. That is your class. As sure as I'm sitting here, that is your class. All right, let me let him go. Sorry. We that, think they realize, oh my God, 15 minutes is almost up. I better look like I'm studying. And you notice that at 15 minutes, they start to tail off again. Other people have found exactly the same results for medical students computer programmers, information workers, pretty much everybody, about a two to three to five minute focus before we get distracted. And what distracts us most? Technology. Look what happens with the number of windows that they open up while they're studying. Again, on the bottom are the minutes, on the top are the number of windows. Notice, by the way, where it peaks, which is that, that eight to 10 minute mark where they got the most distracted. They're continually opening up more windows. And in fact, the most off tasks had the most windows open. So remember I said we, we asked them the grade point average and we thought this is crazy from 15 minutes, can we predict who will be a better student, who will have a better grade point average? And in fact, we could. First of all, those who stayed on task longer, more of the 15 minutes had a better grade point average. Not surprising, but nice. Those who told us they had strategies for studying had a better grade point average. That's good also. Now comes the bad news. Those who prefer task switching, working on something, switching to this, back and forth, worse grades. Those who consume more media during the day, spend more time on their phones, more time on their computer, more time on their devices, worse grades. And there was one more predictor. Remember I said we saw what was on their computer screen? Visiting one website just once in the 15 minutes led to worse grades. And guess what website? Facebook. If they visited Facebook just once, it didn't matter whether they visited once or 15 times, they had worse grades. It's not just students, however, who are distracted. This is a Pew Research uh, Internet in American Life project that just came out. I thought it was totally appropriate. It said 25% of couples say smartphones distract their partners. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> So why can't we focus? Why can't we pay attention? What's wrong with us? Well, we're facing two problems. In the outside world, we're getting constant alerts, notifications, beeps, vibrations from our smartphones, which we all carry 24 seven, literally. And television has changed. Television used to be different. It used to be slower. And now there's quick cuts. There's, there's scrolling bars on the bottom and the top and the side and everywhere. But inside the brain is what's happening more importantly. So two things are going on. One, mind wandering happens. And two, the brain is always thinking. And what it's thinking is oftentimes about technology. So part of the problem is behind, right here, behind our frontal area, behind our forehead. It's called the prefrontal cortex. I'm sure many of you know this. The pre that's me having my prefrontal cortex scanned. Luckily, they found something. Um, <laughs> The prefrontal cortex is very important. It is, first of all, and first and foremost, our executive controller. 
It is the seat of working memory. It's the seat of where attention and focus are. It's where we make our decisions. It's where we control whether we multitask or not. And importantly for young people, it's impulse control. It's controlling whether we make decisions that are not good for us. So let me talk a little bit about what we know about neurons in, in the brain and particularly in the body. When you are born, your nerve cells are like uninsulated wires. They're like wires if you strip all the coating off of it. And if you do that and then you plug something into a socket, you'll see sparks going all over the place. So this is what a neuron looks like with sparks coming out. And in fact, what happens is once you're born, you start to develop these, this coating called myelin, which are just fatty cells that wrap, start to wrap themselves around neurons. And they continue to wrap themselves around neurons until you are old enough, and I'll tell you in a few minutes when you are old enough, to have all your neurons all insulated and all coded so the transmissions go from point A to point B effectively. The last area to be myelinated is right here, that exact area that's your executive controller, that's your impulse control. This chart shows that myelination, the process, is not really complete until people are in their 20s or even early 30s. And sadly, you'll notice that after about 45, it starts to go back down again, and we start to lose myelin, which, mean, which explains, by the way, why in, you'll be watching television, you'll walk into the kitchen, you'll open up the refrigerator door, and you'll say, hmm, why am I here? <laughs> it's why when you lose your keys, you keep looking in the same place over and over and over again, hoping they'll magically appear. So what does it all mean? First of all, without myelin around your nerve cells, neurons don't conduct cell signals. The last area is right up here. This is your executive controller. This is your boss. And this doesn't happen until your late 20s and even in your early 30s. We spend a lot of time studying young adults and teenagers and even preteens now in terms of their ability to focus and attend. But it's not only about the structural part, it's really more about the biochemical part. And a lot of those chemicals have to do with anxiety. Just a few statistics for you. Two thirds of all teens and young adults check their smartphones every 15 minutes or less. Even if they don't have an alert, a notification, they check them anyway. Half of those get anxious if we don't let them check in, and I'll give you a study that shows that. Three quarters of teens and young adults sleep with their phone with the ringer either on or on vibrate right next to their bed. And lest we think adults don't do that, half of all adults use their smartphone as an alarm clock. Not a very good idea. If it's your alarm clock, you get up in the middle of the night, you look at the time, and all of a sudden you get notifications and alerts coming in, and it affects your brain, and it keeps you awake. Has anybody ever felt their pocket vibrating? They've reached in, grabbed their phone, and there's nothing there. It's called phantom pocket vibration syndrome. And believe it or not, it happens to all of us. And think about the ramifications of this great human experiment. 10 years ago, if you felt a vibration down here by, down here somewhere, what would you have done? You'd have reached down and scratched because it would have been an itch. Now we don't even think it's an itch, we think it's a message. We think something important must be coming in, something critical. So let me relate a study um, that I think is very instructive and important. We brought in 163 college students into a big auditorium. Half of them randomly got shelled into one door and they were told, go sit down, take your books and put them underneath the table, take your phone and turn it off and put it underneath the table. You can't talk, you're not allowed to, you can't be in the experiment if you talk, you can't do anything. The other half went in the other door and they were told exactly the same thing except we told them, oh, by the way, give us your phone. We'll give you a claim check. So then what we did is 10 minutes later and then 20 more minutes later, so at 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and 50 minutes, we measured their level of anxiety. So what happened? Interestingly enough, it didn't matter whether your smartphone was under your desk turned off or we had it. Everybody got anxious, but some people got more anxious than others. People who were light daily phone users, meaning they could take it or leave it, they used it a little, they didn't use it all the time, 
If you look at their anxiety level, it was pretty flat. It didn't increase. Moderate daily phone users, a little increase in anxiety in the beginning, but then they leveled off. They got used to not having their phone. What about the heavy users, those kids, young adults who are always using their phone? First of all, they started out 10 minutes more anxious. In the first 10 minutes before we did the first measurement, they were already more anxious and they continued to get more and more anxious. And actually the researchers were going to go another 20 minutes, but they decided it wasn't healthy. So what happens biochemically? What's happening in our brain? Brand new study by uh, Leo Yekulis at Stanford just came out last week. And what he did is he put a device on, on people's computer screen that assessed what they were looking at at any given instant and when they switched from one screen to the next. He also had them wear a little band around their wrist that measured arousal. So first of all, he found that they switched from one screen to the next every 19 seconds. Every 19 seconds, that's astounding. And the most common switches, one in four switches, were either to email, where they spent only 40 seconds, just like dip over to email, check it quickly, or to Facebook, where they spent 78 seconds. But what happened to the arousal, which I think is much more interesting. On this graph, what you see is in the very middle is when they switched, and they measured before they switched and after they switched. Right here, at about 12 seconds before they start to switch, arousal starts to increase. What is that? Is it good arousal? Is it bad arousal? Well, interestingly enough, he divided the switches into two categories, work category and entertainment, entertainment being Facebook, games and watching videos. And he looked at switches from work, doing work to an entertainment screen or from an entertainment screen to a work screen. From the entertainment screen to the work screen, he found no difference in arousal, it was flat. Look at this, 25 seconds before switching from work to entertainment, your arousal level starts to go up. So people are starting to get excited 25 seconds before. How can you be working when part of your brain 25 seconds before is already getting excited about switching to Facebook, a video, or games. Gary Small at UCLA um, did some research where he compared people reading a book to people searching Google, and you could see that the brain is much more active searching Google than it was reading a book. Um, we're also starting to learn from neuroscience, and, and some of these studies are in need of replication, but I'm gonna try to summarize some of the things that we have learned that we know. For example, if you have more social network friends, more Facebook friends, more Instagram, whatever, people with more social network friends so show an increased size of both their hippocampus, which is the seat of memory, and their amygdala, which is the seat of emotions. People who are gamers, and most of the gaming research, by the way, is done in Asia, um, show increased activation in the striatum, which is the risk-reward area, where you're weighing the risks and reward possibilities. Violent game players show increase in areas related to aggression, but also decreased emotions in the amygdala. And web addicts show increased overall activity across their entire brain, but the efficiency of the neurotransmission is not very good. So what do we need to do to stay healthy? Basically, there are three things I think we need to learn to do. We need to learn to focus and attend. We need to figure out how to calm our brain and we need to understand the choices we make. So first of all, we need to learn how to focus and attend. And how do we do this in a world that is totally involved with technology? Here's a cartoon that displays that. Parents are saying this should be interesting and there's three kids mowing the lawn, all texting at the same time. Is this what we need to do? It's the New Yorker cartoon. Those of you who have dogs will appreciate that more probably. And this is called the iPotty. It's an actual device. It was introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show this last year. And it does not come with the iPod, uh, the iPad by the way. You have to use your own iPad, but it's designed to get little kids to focus on learning to potty train. And then is this where we're headed? You can see here somebody taking a picture of a family on vacation and the family's not paying attention because they're all on their phones. 
So how do you train your brain to focus? That's a very critical thing. Think about a coffee break. Think about the old-fashioned cigarette break. We've created something called technology breaks, and they're very simple. We use them in schools. We use them in homes. We use them in restaurants. We even use them in business meetings. The basic idea is very simple. What I would have students in a school do is at the very beginning of class, they would take their phones, they would look for one minute, and then after one minute, the teacher would say, okay, turn your phone off, turn it upside down, put it right in front of the desk, and someone set their alarm for 15 minutes. When 15 minutes happens, it's the person whose alarm is set jumps up and yells, tech break, really loud, and that's the stimulus that everybody gets to check for one more minute phone upside down in front of them. So what happens to this? Well, eventually the kids develop a, a sense of, oh, this is really exciting, this really works, and then the teacher expands it to 20 minutes, 25, and then 30. And in most of the situations, what we do is we have, start the class with a one or two minute tech break, check everything, 30 minutes of lesson, one or two minute tech break, 30 minutes of lesson, our class is over. Teachers report amazing success with this, that the kids are able to focus. Why? Because that upside down phone sends a signal that says, don't get anxious. You don't need to worry. You're going to get to check it soon. So how can you reset your own brain? Well, obviously meditation and biofeedback does it. Nature breaks do it. We know that walking outside in nature for just five minutes resets and calms your brain. Listening to music, looking at art, particularly art that you find attractive and beautiful, calms your brain. Exercise calms your brain. Laughing calms your brain. Taking a hot bath calms your brain. You know the old adage, you get your best ideas in the shower? Turns out hot water calms your brain. Talking live to a friend, as long as it's a positive conversation, calms your brain. You can't talk to somebody and have an argument because that activates your brain. Practicing a foreign language calms your brain. Playing a musical instrument calms your brain. How often do you have to do it? About Five to 10 minutes every two hours seems to be efficient way of calming and relaxing your brain. It's also about what we call metacognition, knowing how your brain works. That's very important. Whenever I talk to groups of children from three years old on up, I talk about their brains and what goes on in their brains. Knowing how you best work in an environment with technology and knowing when your brain is overloaded and how to calm it down. So I advise something called, very simple called the ABC method. A, be aware of the options. Know what distracts you. If your phone distracts you, put it away. If email distracts you, like me, turn it off. If notifications bother you, turn them off. B, breathe, calm, relax. Reset your brain often. About every 90 minutes to two hours, reset your brain. And finally, make good choices, good metacognitive choices don't keep switching your focus from one thing to the other. Try to learn to focus for 15 to 30 minutes at a time. You will be far better off. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Uh, there's a really good piece of research out there um, on this whole, you know, kids are supposed to be able to be the uh, kings when it comes to multitasking. And what it shows extremely well is number one, there's no such thing as multitasking. There is switching that Rosen talks about. And even if you were to sit down, and uh, we used to play a little game in here when I had a lot of people in this room, and we would go in and we would do a multitasking test. In other words, it would find out how well do you multitask. And invariably, it was a game that was kind of gamey, you know, it's it very similar to a, a, a game that you would play where you have to make decisions and then you were switched off to do something else, but you this was over here running and you had to come back and forth to it. What was fascinating about it, every time we did that, the women in the room killed the guys in terms of their ability to multitask. And what the research shows very clearly is, A, there's no such thing as multitasking, you're just switching. And women are extremely good at being able to do a little bit of something over here, come back over here, do a little bit of something, Go back to there, do a little bit of something. Multitasking doesn't exist. I think what Rosen does so well in this is he 
frames the argument for what the problem is in a way that's really kind of hard to disagree with. I mean, my God, how can you argue with brain science? When we do our heavy lift, when we talk about the TPAC and all that, we're going to be talking about something called UDL, Universal Design for Learning, that another researcher by the name of David Rose has done. And it is also fascinating because it kind of gets into that how the brain works, what we see when we look at people using their brains, that is really, really eye-opening. Okay, I'm gonna go maybe, let me look here. So we, we looked at, we started off with Marshall McLuhan, who basically laid down the red line back in 1967. The kids were no longer really receiving an education more information, they were getting more information outside of the classroom. We looked a little bit at distraction. I think we all kind of get that one. That's that's not too big a lift. Uh, but then we went down here and listened to Clay Shirky talking about cognitive surplus and how what we are seeing is if we could focus in on the right idea and focus in on the tool, instead of the tool becoming the focus, the idea is the focus, and then the tool helps us with that. Let me end it off with this guy. And then we'll go and do the picture chart. Kevin Kelly I wanted to, is fascinating. to take some moments this morning to talk about something that um, I think is really, um, really big. We heard um, Jennifer Wiseman talk about the glory of the cosmos. And um, in that kind of image of these are two colliding galaxies, we can kind of get a sense of the presence of God there. And um, there's lots of books written about how nature's, uh, the relationship between God and nature, and how nature in some ways we can at its best feel. It Let me stop right here to help you understand here. This is not a religious nut, okay? This is not a priest, this is not a... This guy created Wired Magazine. And he created Wired Magazine to help people understand technology. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a little background there and then I'll let him go back on it. It's a reflection of the divine. But we are surrounded by other things, this building, this city. And my question is, in technology, where's God? What's the relationship of God and technology? Is it is technology just another aspect of of the fall? Is it something good? Is it is it positive? Is it just neutral? What's the relationship between technology and God? And that's what I want to explore, because it is something that surrounds us in many many ways. And the problem is, of course, we don't really have a good definition of technology. This is what most people think technology is, right? It's stuff that doesn't work yet. Right? But obviously it has to be more than that. This, this chair I'm sitting on, uh, the concrete here in the roads, the electricity, all that stuff is technology too. Like long before you were born. Um, and if you take these two, these two artifacts about the same size, okay, the one on the, the, one, the, one on the left is um, uh, stone hammer, thousands of years old. Um, one person can make that. You here, probably with a little effort, could could, could make this thing. And um, the one on the right, though, is is one that nobody here could make. In fact, all of us here, as smart as you all are, could not make this thing. And that's because it relies on hundreds of other technologies for each of the technologies that's embedded in it. So, so in some ways, it's kind of like a network of technologies. It's it's um, uh, thousands of technologies that are kind of codependent and, and almost like an ecosystem of technologies. And I'm interested in that ecosystem. I'm interested in the way in which um, this web of technologies supports each other and, and, and are codependent on it. So we have this very, very large system of things that we've made. And I call it the technium to indicate the fact that it is in some ways a, a web of technologies. It's not one thing and they don't stand alone. They, in fact, require each other. And, excuse me, this thing is falling off. So um, that system, like any kind of a system, has certain biases, certain agendas, certain tendencies. And I use the word want provocatively to suggest 
that technology as a system, as a whole, not your spoon, not your iPad, but the whole thing that we've made in some ways has certain biases. And uh, this is a, a, a picture of a robot, uh, the little garage robot, and it's a robot that's been programmed to find its own power. So it runs around the offices in looking for power sources. And it is smart enough to actually recognize it and take this tail, which is a cord, and plug itself in to recharge its batteries. And I had the opportunity to stand between it and a plug. <laughs> I could feel it. It really wanted that electricity. It wasn't going to harm me, but it was going to find a way to recharge its batteries. And I use the word want in that sense of maybe the way that plants want light. They're not conscious and they're not intelligent, but they are leaning that direction. They're, they're doing things to, they're an agent to get light. And the system that we've made of all this stuff in our world actually has biases. It has wants. It has leanings. It's attempting something. When we make these very complicated things, they have a bias. My question is, what's the bias? So technology has its own agenda. That's the bad news in some sense. The thing that we've made has something of itself, some level of autonomy. The good news, which is I hope to get to very, very quickly, just to bring you to the end of the story, is that actually this has a moral dimension, and it's a positive moral dimension. So what does technology want? Well, the most amazing discovery happened about 50 years ago, and that was a discovery that, in fact, um, the essence of life, the living things that we could see around us, was not carbon, was not water, was not energy, was, in fact, information. The discovery of DNA, the code of DNA, the, the understanding of that's a genetic code, it's like a programming code, that we can program things, that we can manipulate and make and change life through the information. That's a huge insight. And what is technology but itself? A rearrangement of information. Information flows to technology. We take atoms and we, re, we use information to rearrange them into new forms and shapes. And so basically the essence of technology is also information. So there is an equivalency that's not quite equivalent, but there's, there's a similarity or correspondence between information and life. And what we now know is, is that um, we can think about lots of things in technologies as basically an extension of life. So I say what, basically what technology wants turns out to be very similar to what life as a system, the living organisms, the meadows, the rainforests, the, the species as, as they interact with, with each other, form a system that has many, many, many parallels with the system of technology, not the individual components, but the entire system that we've made. So one of the things that life wants is it wants to become more specialized. Things start off general, you have a general cell, and over time, they become specialized. So we have, in our own bodies, we have 250 different cell types, muscle cells, skeletal cells, all these things, whereas some of the primitive organisms have only one type of, of a cell. We see the same thing in technology. Things start off general, like the general hammer. We have specialized hammers. First, we'll have a general ca a camera that does everything. Then we'll have underwater cameras, high-speed cameras, infrared cameras. Then we'll have an infrared underwater high-speed camera. We keep specializing. And we can see where technology is going by saying, whatever it is that we have today, in the future, we'll have a more specialized version of it. That's the general trend. Yeah, I'm going to stop him there. This is really interesting, what, he, what he's talking about. I want to lose our focus here too much <laughs> since we've all this talking about distractions. Let me try to get your heads around what we're doing here. I'm throwing a lot of information at you, not just the information that's in the book, but I wanted you to hear these people that uh, Dr. Fullen uh, uses in his book. Your job will be to try to make sense of all of this. And by that, I mean, I want you to make sense of it through the various lenses that you would look at all this. Um, you know, when people do this assignment, uh, some folks will land on Larry Rosen and they'll focus on what Larry is talking about. Other people go back to, to the Shirky stuff. Some people go to the parking pedagogy stuff that, that uh, Prinsky does <clears throat> because he does, it's very focused on education. What I want us to start realizing here is three ideas. Number one, we are surrounded by technology. It ain't going away. And the more we keep trying to keep it out of schools, 
the more overwhelming it's going to be and what's going to happen, especially in public schools, because the private school people already got this figured out, folks, by the way. When I would train KTIP teachers for the archdiocese, one of the questions I would always ask them now, for those of you who don't know KTIP, well, of course you all do. Mark, do you know what KTIP is? Okay, so KTIP is that teacher beginning. So I'm sitting here in the room full of beginning teachers. And I would ask them, and they were representing all over the place. They were high school, middle school, elementary. And I would say to them, so how many of you are being expected to have a presence online? Every hand went up. How many of you will be using something called Google Classroom? That one, that one kind of narrowed it down a little bit because some schools use other things, but they all had the same commonality. They were sharing, they were doing things with kids through uh, an online presence. Now think about how long it's taken us. By the way, that was five years ago. How long has it gotten taken us to get to that point in public schools? And we still aren't there. I mean, you know, one of the things I hear is that when I ask, when I go into school, so are you all using Google Classroom? Well, it's here, but no one's really explained to us how we're supposed to use it. The technology wants to get in and we can't keep hiding it anymore. We could make up draconian rules about if we see that cell phone, we're going to take it away from you. And then what happens is what we saw with the kid and the security guard where he literally and she got into a fight, which is, you know, nobody wins and knows. Number one. Number two, we have to get away from technology being isolated. We have to get away from it being this thing that we use in certain times of the day. We have to realize it's a tool. Could you imagine walking into a classroom and telling kids they couldn't use their pencil and paper? Could you imagine a teacher walking into a classroom and being told, well, by the way, we don't want you using that blackboard over there. If you go back and look at history and technology and education, the biggest fight, the biggest fight occurred very early on with the introduction of the blackboard. The opponents of it said teachers will become lazy. All they have to do is come in and write all over the blackboard and then students would come in and sit down and just copy it down. Education would slowly devolve into the fact that all we have to do is come in and look at stuff. Number three, we have to realize that we're dealing with very different people. We got to get over that. You know, that when I was in school, I knew how to sit still and listen. We got to get over that. And I think what Rosen shows extremely well is we all have become the 15 minute, uh, we all had the 15 minute uh, time limit. Um, look at how when you go in, I don't know, it was the last time you were in for surgery. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was having issues with AFib, totally cured of it now, by the way. And I'd go in and the first thing that you do when you get wheeled in is, you know, the anesthesiologist comes in. And the anesthesiologist, and I thought this was just one guy, but the more I kept noticing was that they come in and they put music on. And I'd ask him, why are you listening to the music? It helps me relax and focus and concentrate. We turn it off, don't worry, <laughs> when we get busy with you. We turn it off. Um, but we have to realize this 15-minute thing. I had a student who taught geometry at a tough school. She was ready to quit because she couldn't figure out how to get her kids engaged with, with the uh, geometry. She said all they wanted to do was look at their damn phones. Well, okay. So we did this whole thing that you saw Rosen talking about. And lo and behold, they were able to stay with her. The next thing we did is she created a YouTube channel. Now this gal was your basic content queen. She knew her content code. She was that person you ran away from at parties because somehow the conversation got around to Euclidean geometry. Beautiful gal, really knew her stuff. So she bought into the idea of creating content that kids could see when they were out of school. It's old hat now, but back then, uh, still kind of new. 
And what she discovered was she would go home after a day of teaching. Actually, she got to the point where she could do it right after school. And she would create these videos. Her first video was 30 minutes long. She posted it into YouTube. She advertised it heavily in the classroom. She got maybe 10, 20 users or subscribers. And I said to her, I said, do you know about the 15 minute rule? I said, now go back and try to figure out the 15 minute rule. She did that. She got a few more subscribers. I said to her, now we have to come up with the realization that 15 minutes is too long. Maybe we ought to try something else. So she went back and played around with it. And you know where her peak of subscribers was? Seven minutes. So her job was to explain in seven minutes the core concepts of what she had taught that day. And what she found was, is when you took away all the interruptions, uh, are you falling asleep over there? Pick up your book. No, don't poke her. When she stripped all that out so that she focused exactly on what she wanted to talk about, seven minutes. And her amount of subscribers went to the roof. Now, as I said, this is a content queen. So not only did her subscribers in her classroom go up, but the people who saw this content on YouTube started subscribing to her. And now she's coming to me and she's saying, what do I do with 7,000 subscribers? I told you smile, move on. We did not find a correlation, which was sad, but we did not find a correlation to the number of times kids watched her videos and how well they did on tests. Why? Guess what? Why? There was no formative involved. So it was pretty much, you went home, you watched the video, you came back to school. She picked up on the next batch of information, taught it, taught it, taught it. And then at the end of the week, she gave the quiz. She thought what she's going to see was the kids who went home and watched the videos again would do well on the quizzes. They didn't. So the piece that was missing was she had to go back to her teaching that she was doing into the YouTube and find a way of putting a formative assessment into that. Now we started seeing the trend toward kids being able to do better. Last thought. We have to start pushing children to quit working to please us. We have to start pushing kids to create, to critically think, and then reflect. What I did was a piece of crap. What I did I think it's darn good. Now, we could do that through a, a, a development of critical friends. We can do that through people looking at others' work. Uh, Steve was sitting here talking about the fact that in his school right now, they're sending teachers around to watch other teachers. Bad idea. was always a bad idea uh, because it develops that, that pathology in a school of, well, you're looking how I'm doing it and you don't like it. Well, who the hell are you to come into my classroom? What we need to get be working on is people looking at their own stuff, looking at it in a way that they can look at it and say, this is good stuff. All right. Now let me show you how you're going to do that. You're going to create your own understanding of this. We're going to use a tool called Pictochart. I love Pictochart because it's so easy to use. And it has the ability to create some really interesting stuff. At the same time, if you struggle, Pictochart is so simple to use that you can create something pretty cool. Now, and also it links to classroom. I'm going to show you how it works because it won't take me long. My 15 minute rule. You want to start timing me, you can. And at the end of the 15 minute rule, we're done, gentlemen, and folks out there in the great beyond. A couple of things you need to know. Number one, when you go into the, by the way, and here's the videos if you need to watch it, how to use it. Uh, it's so easy to use. There's really not a lot that, that I need to show you. You're going to click on this link, or you can go to pictochart.com. What you need to know to be able to fully use it is I'm going to give you my username and password freely. This will allow you to have full access to pick the chart. 
The username is my email address, which is sbswan02 at louisville.edu. The password is ULIT241, all lowercase, all one word. I'll do it one more time. Well, you can see the SBSwan02 up there. The password is ULIT, University of Louisville Instructional Technology, ULIT241. That's my office number. Okay? Freely give it to you. If you're going to use this with kids, and I sure as hell hope you will, get back with me and let's have a conversation about that. So as you can see, people have created pick to chart classes for their kids to use to where they're not giving them the SB Swan 02. If you use the SB Swan 02 ULIT, it's not the end of the world. This isn't anything important. It's not like you can get in my bank accounts or anything like that using it. Okay. So does it work? Well, basically you come up here and you click on create new and it says, what do you want to create? We are creating an infographic. So we're going to click on that one. When we do that, it gives us a choice of free templates, pro templates. That's why you get to log in as me. You get to have your own. If you go to the pro templates, again, it gives you what I call pretty pictures. It's interesting when you show this to kids because invariably the kid that kind of struggles, he or she will look down through here and find one that's really simple to use, like this one. And they'll go in and they'll take a preview look of it. Now, what I'm showing you is here's the template, but when you decide to use it, everything that's on this template is edible, meaning you can change it. So what kids will do when they pick these real simple ones is they'll go in and they'll start picking the pieces that they can change easily. So they'll come over here and they'll take out that big, whatever the heck it was, and they'll come in and they'll do chapters two and three. And they'll create three, Steve, not two. They'll come in and they'll create their own. Then they'll come down here and they'll start looking at what the verbiage is and the structure is, and they'll start throwing things out. So like they'll get rid of the big S and maybe they'll put a P in here. That'll represent the uh, problems, so on and so on that are in here. Now, when you do that, look over here on the side, you do have a way of adding things depending upon what you clicked in. So you notice when I clicked up here, now I can get into my uh, fonts and everything if I want to play with that. I can totally wipe out stuff that's in here and I can just keep going through and I can get rid of it. But over here, I have the ability to go in and look at graphics. I have the ability to look at uploads. And when you look at uploads, you get the benefit of six years of people using this thing. <laughs> so there's all kinds of uploads in here. You can browse images. You can go and find your own, put them in here and add to the, uh, the group as a whole. When you go to graphics, you can look at shapes and icons. You can search for things. You can go in and do photos. You can search for photos if you want to put those. It tells you some information about what to put in. Well, if I'm going to find something that I want to use, it's really hard. You just drag it over and drop it in. And at this point, it starts looking more like PowerPoint than anything else. But with the, the beauty of using your own or, or using someone else's template is you kind of have a sense of where you might want to go. There's a place where you can put in text and you can put text in in your own boxes. You can change what the color is going to look like. And then under tools, you can go in and you could literally put in the Larry Rosen, if you wanted to put in his video into here. 
and you know how to do that. You'll go back to the, the YouTube, you go up and you copy the URL, you drop it in here, insert the video. Now that's one way to do it. The other way you can do it is you can create your own. And when you do that, you're basically starting with a fresh canvas. And here is just a blank canvas. And what we found was the kids who had that classic abundance of ideas, and you know those kids, they drive you crazy. Those kids that have a classic abundance of ideas, they went here. Now, that's not to say that this wasn't good stuff, okay? The, the other way, using the templates, was not good stuff. It was just as good as anything the kids did who created from scratch. So what I'm trying to say to you is don't be afraid to go in and use a template or go in and do it from scratch. I forgot to tell you this first. The face, first thing you want to do is up here where it says untitled infograph. Please put your name on there. Okay. You build it and then you save it. Actually, it's a wise idea to save it right after you title it. Then you're going to share it. And when you share it, what it allows you to do is let anyone view your sharing link. It's just that simple. And there's your sharing right here. And what so Steve is asking you to do is to build the picture chart, to build an infographic, to create a padlet, not create a padlet, to put a entry into our padlet, and then to put your picture chart in there. So when I go back to here, and I'm going to find that at the top level of this module is a place just like you did last week, there is a Padlet waiting for you. Now, I left the Padlet, uh, the, the entries for this particular one in here uh, because I wanted you to see how it worked. I will wipe all this out tonight. I'll take them all out. Uh, for me to add one, I just basically click on it. Remember the link thing? And now I'm going to drop in the link to my particular one. And what it's going to do is it will basically post that like this. Don't freak out when it doesn't happen right away. It takes it a little bit. But as you can see, if you look down here, here's Liz's infographic. And it pulls up Liz's ideas. Okay. Now notice she basically focused on his criteria about irresistibly engaging, why some people think better, and then the skinny, that's part of the chapter that he spends a lot of time with. So this isn't, I don't think it's terribly hard to do. You're going to go in, you're going to go into the picture chart, you're going to create it. If you're uncomfortable with trying to get it to work off of here, just open it on the web. Take that URL that's here from the web, bring it back in, put your Padlet in, put the link in there. Use the correct way to do it. And save it. And it starts this little line running back and forth. And up here, make sure you put your name in here. Steve Swan Adler. And there it is. Okay. That's all you have to do. So the thinking part of it is inside the infographic, all you're using the Padlet for is for the gallery walk. And like I told you last week, um, no, one can, no one can wipe out your 
infographic here, Padlet um, contribution, except the administrator of the Padlet, and that's blocked. So you don't have to worry about anybody messing with your stuff. I'm going to finish up with my two friends here in the room. Gentlemen, did I do the picta chart too fast? Were you okay with it? Do you have questions? It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you're uncomfortable with, uh, as I said, the first thing that I would do is just scroll down through here, look at these templates, find one that kind of grabs you. The pro templates, there's tons of them. That's one place I would start. If you look at this and you're not finding one that you're comfortable with, you're much better, better off with just coming over and building it from scratch. Uh, you can go in and preview it so you get a sense of what it is. What are we looking for? We cover all kinds of territory in chapters two and three. Chapters two and three. That's all you're doing. You will not be here next week, so it gives you plenty of time to do chapters two and three. But Steve, you also have one in here for four and five. Yes, because when I get back together with you, we'll go back and we'll look at two and three, what you've created. I will then assume that you understand the skinny, how it works, and you're going to create one all on your own without any presentations, without me feeding you information, just by reading chapter four and five in Stratosphere. Then, after we get done with the book, we will go to what I consider to be the lift of the course. And by that, I mean the work in the course. And that'll be understanding TPAC, TIM, and UDL, which are three foundations of technology integration. Let's jump back to our lone voice out here in the wilderness. You good, Ms. Gupton? Have we covered it enough? You understand what your assignment is. All right. You're only doing chapters two and three. We gave you tons of other resources. Um, you're creating it. Make sure you title it right away when you go into the picture chart so you could find it again and come back to it. I can't tell you how many people have created something in here uh, and they forgot to do that simple little step to create the picture chart by putting their name up there in the upper left hand corner. If you don't do that, you know, it kind of gets lost. But also, if you do do that, it's not the end of the world, people. We can find them. They'll be here. But please make sure you do the save. Because if you don't do that, then it will be lost. Not titling, it's not the end of the world, but not saving it is the end of the world. And as I said, as you can see here, People have used this with kids, with kids in their classrooms, and you're more than welcome to do it. Just let us have a little chat so I can help you see how you're using my administrator login to log in, but then you're creating your space for your kids. Okay, we're done. As always, those of you in the great beyond, if you need help with any of this stuff, 502-457-2937. Uh, Carrie, if you don't have any questions, I'll stop and let you throw one out. You gave me a yes, sir, so I'm going to assume that you got it. All right. Gentlemen, any questions for the good of us all here in the room? Okay, Carrie, I'm going to turn it off. Thank you for being here tonight.